Hello everyone and uh, welcome to the Life in the Universe pandemic series. This is my set of short talks uh, for people in isolation or in fact anyone just interested in uh, the topic of life in the universe. Is there life elsewhere? What is all this life on the earth? And a pandemic seems like a good time to think about these things. Uh, today I thought I would talk about this question. Uh, what is the habitable zone? And this is a term that you may have seen in the media. Often they talk about, uh, you'll see in news stories, scientists have found a planet in the habitable zone. Um, scientists are looking for planets in the habitable zone. What does this mean? Well, intuitively you can understand it means something to do with habitability, the ability to support life, and that's absolutely right. In fact, the habitable zone is the zone around a star uh, where a planet can have liquid water on its surface, a bit like our own planet Earth, where we're just the right distance from the sun, where the uh, temperature on our, uh, on our planetary surface can support oceans and rivers and lakes and so on and so forth. Now, the first thing we should point out, which you may already have noticed, is this is a bit of a restrictive term because, of course, life needs more than just liquid water. It needs an energy supply. It needs carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus and other things as well. So defining a habitable zone just based on the presence of liquid water is far too narrow. But nevertheless, it turns out to be useful because it broadly tells us where we should go and look for planets around other stars. And then once we find a planet in the so-called habitable zone, then we could ask questions about whether it's got the other requirements for life. Now, the habitable zone is sometimes called the Goldilocks zone because it's the place where temperatures are just right, not too hot, not too cold to support liquid water. So what happens if we do go further towards our star? Well, what happens is that temperatures can become too great. And if there's carbon dioxide, for example, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the temperature can become so great the liquid water is no longer sustained. The planet Venus is an example of a planet that is too near the sun. It's outside the habitable zone. Venus has a temperature, surface temperature, just above 460 degrees. There's no liquid water. It cannot support life on its surface. All the water has long since gone in what we call the runaway greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect where, uh, where heat is trapped in the planet by atmospheric gases has got too great. It's become a runaway effect and the planet has become too hot. So get too close to the star and you become like Venus and you can't support um, liquid water. Get too far away and you get too cold. For example, the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide begins to condense out in the atmosphere and it's no longer very good at keeping the surface of the planet warm. The outer temperature of the habitable zone or the outer limits of the habitable zone are less well known. Some people think that if you have a planet with lots of hydrogen in the atmosphere, which is a very good greenhouse gas, maybe your habitable zone could be far away outside uh, into the outer reaches of a solar system. So the limits of the habitable zone are not really fully understood. But nevertheless, we know enough about planetary environments to be able to broadly define where the habitable zone is. What's interesting about it is it changes over time. For example, four billion years ago, when life, uh, we think, first emerged on our own planet, the sun was about 30% less luminous than it is today. In other words, the habitable zone would have been nearer to the sun. And as the sun's luminosity increases, the habitable zone will slowly shift out as uh, you need to be further away to be able to sustain those temperatures for liquid water. So if we were interested in thinking about habitability of a planet over billions of years, uh, how uh, life could emerge on a planet and become complex and ultimately become intelligent, in our own case, uh, something on the order of four billion years, that habitable zone is going to be a lot narrower because it's moving out. And this is called the continuously habitable zone, a place where there are conditions for liquid water continuously over a period of time. So this is all very uh, interesting and it gives us an idea of where we should look for life um, or where we should look for planets around other stars that could support biology. Of course, the habitable zone will depend upon the different um, star that you happen to be around. If you're around an M star, which are much longer lived stars and are less luminous, the habitable zone is nearer in because you need to be nearer the star to get that warmth, to maintain liquid water. And the interesting thing about M stars is if you're really close into the star, your, your planet becomes tidally locked, which means that one star side of the planet is always facing towards the star and the other side is always in darkness. So as the planet rotates around the star, orbits around the star, uh, one side is always dark 
on one side is always light. So could a planet that is under those conditions but in the habitable zone support life? We don't really know, but it would certainly be a very different world than the Earth that we are familiar with. If you look around F stars, which are much more short-lived stars than our own sun and much brighter, the habitable zone is further away because you need to be further away to maintain the right temperature for liquid water. So you can see that the habitable zone depends upon how much time you're considering and what sort of star you're considering. But broadly, it's a really useful term for thinking about where you might want to look for rocky Earth-sized planets around other stars. So rather than looking everywhere, looking in the habitable zone at least gives you some idea of where you might want to look for possible planets, where you could ask follow-up questions. Once you think the planet has liquid water, does it have energy supplies? Does it have carbon? And so on and so forth. So it's a good first order question to ask. Interestingly, our own planet will probably leave our own habitable zone, people think, in about a billion and a half to two billion years time. We don't know the exact time, but at that point, uh, we will be, our planet will be heated up and we will become more like Venus. We will enter into a runaway greenhouse effect, a moist greenhouse effect will turn into a runaway greenhouse effect and all the water will begin to dissipate. And it's a rather morbid but fascinating question to ask what will be the last creature to survive on the Earth at this time? And I've often had conversations about this with my colleagues and we think it will probably be some high temperature tolerant microbes, some acid tolerant microbe living in that last droplet of water on the earth as all the water vaporizes. But it's something you might want to think about what will be the last creature to survive on the earth when we finally leave the habitable zone. Now, of course, things are a bit more complicated than I've suggested as usual. Uh, of course, we could have a planet that has a very elliptical orbit where it comes in close to a star and then goes far away again. And when it goes far away again, it may be in the colding, cold, freezing abyss of the outer regions of its solar system, but maybe it traps just enough heat to be able to come back in again and get near its star and warm up. So it could be possible that planets are outside and inside the habitable zone in different parts of their orbit, but overall, averaged over the whole orbit, they manage to maintain habitable conditions. And we should also notice that a great deal of life on our own planet is deep underground heated up by uh, radioactive minerals. So although there may not be liquid water on the surface of a planet, it could still be habitable uh, in, inside the planet. So there are two complications with the habitable zone. The first one I've already mentioned, which is that you could be in the habitable zone, but not have the other basic requirements for life beyond liquid water. If you have a planet that's lacking in phosphorus or nitrogen, it may have liquid water, but it may not be habitable for life. So we could have planets in the habitable zone that are not habitable. But nevertheless, the habitable zone is still useful to at least start to think about planets and where we might look for them. The other complication we could have is we could have planets outside the habitable zone that are habitable. And a good example of this is the icy moons like Enceladus, the moon of Saturn, or Europa, the moon of Jupiter, where we have good evidence that there is uh, liquid water, liquid water oceans beneath their surfaces. We don't yet know whether they have life or whether they're habitable. But if they are habitable, then there we would have examples of planetary bodies that have conditions for life, but are outside the habitable zone. And in those cases, habitable conditions are made possible not by solar heating, warming up the surface of a planet and allowing for oceans and lakes and so on, but the heating is generated by tidal interactions that buckle the inside of those moons, generating heat that melts the ice and generates liquid water. So we can have liquid water outside the habitable zone. And beyond Europa and Enceladus, Titan might have a subsurface ocean. And even the asteroid series, uh, there is good evidence for liquid, salty, briny uh, liquid beneath the surface of that asteroid. So it's really important to be aware of these limitations that you can have um, a habitable uh, world outside the habitable zone. But of course, these would be very difficult to detect around distant exoplanets. Imagine trying to find a small, uh, ice-covered moon orbiting an exoplanet around a distant star, a moon that does not even have an atmosphere that you can study to try and find gases from life. So it'd be very difficult to find these moons uh, in distant uh, solar systems anyway. But nevertheless, one should be aware of the fact that the habitable zone is a rather restrictive view of life, but it's a very useful view. So that's the habitable zone. You'll see it in the media, people looking for planets in the habitable zone. And now hopefully you know something about why 
that's a useful thing to understand. And also, hopefully now you know some of the limitations in that idea of the habitable zone. Thanks a lot for joining me. Uh, keep well in this pandemic. Bye.